So our passage this morning is Romans 6, particularly verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. We're going to read from the start of Romans 6 because all of what comes before helps to explain the verses we're particularly focusing on. So we're going to read Romans 6 from verse 1. Lord, even as we read your word now, we pray, as we're thinking about the resurrection life, we pray that your word would come alive to us, Lord. Lord, that you would make it to have meaning to us, Lord. So that even if my words may fail, Lord, we pray, Lord, that your words, Lord, would have meaning for us this morning, Lord. Help us, we pray. Lord, reveal Christ to us and what it means for us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptised into Christ Jesus have been baptised into his death. Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Then it tells them how they need to, in the light of what they've just learnt or been reminded of, they need to choose to present themselves to God rather than to sin. As we remember the resurrection this morning, it's great to think about what it meant both for Christ in that moment and continually, and also what it means for us. It's far too big a topic for us to take in fully, but let's try and take in one aspect of it, and particularly what I think that the Lord wants to highlight this morning is the idea of us being alive to God. Alive to God. And we're going to get there as we look at these two verses. So in Romans 6 and verse 10, it talks about the death that Christ died, he died to sin once for all. It's an amazing mystery that Jesus died at all. We all know that, don't we? That the idea that the one who is perfect would come and would be able to die. After all, death comes only through sin. If Adam hadn't sinned, he wouldn't have died. It's only because of the (coughs) sins of each person that each person dies. So for the perfect one to die, it was only possible because the Lord God laid the sins of the world upon his son, Jesus. And that's how it can say the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. In one moment, 
Jesus did something on behalf of everybody. Everybody in the whole world. Not everybody in the whole world responds to this. What you do with Jesus will decide where you spend eternity, in heaven or hell. But Jesus died to make it possible if the whole world turned for the whole world to be in heaven. Because Jesus, in that moment, as he died, he died to sin for everybody. He was causing everybody, everybody's sins, to be laid on himself. So it was as if those sins were his. That's how he was able to die and to yield his spirit up to the Father because of those sins laid upon him. In fact, one or two passages of scripture go a little bit further than just describing sins laid on him. Because it says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 that God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf. To be sin. This is getting across how completely Jesus identified with our sins. Your sin, the things that you're ashamed of, the things that you are well aware of in your life. Uh, particularly hopefully in your past, but we all sin even in the present from time to time. All of those sins made to be laid on Christ and Christ became sin on our behalf. It was for us that he took them on. And that's how it can say that he died to sin once for all. Now it goes on, uh, well, it doesn't go on, sorry. In, in the previous verses, in verse 7, it makes the point that says, He who has died is freed from sin. Obviously, while we're alive, we are sinful. Even though the Lord is working things in us and his character in us as we let him, we still are, by nature, sinners. But when we die, those sins end. So at least as far as earth is concerned, we can live an earthly life full of sin. But when we die, those sins end. In, in a sense, it therefore says, he who has died is freed from sin. And so what Paul is getting across here is that Christ, having for a brief time, having those sins laid on him, he died and those sins are no longer on him. And he is in no way under sin their power under the power of sin and of course as we're going to consider that means we ourselves also can be dead to sin in fact if you're a believer this morning that is an actual reality for you that you have died to sin you might not be living in the good of that you might not have understood it fully yeah. but that is what's happened so jesus on our behalf died to sin there is no way in which we can say that sin is master over him now, is there? He lived a perfect life, for a short time had the sins of the world laid on him, but he is completely freed from sin. He is living a perfect life in heaven. He has died once, died to sin once for all. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just about what he has died to and what we have died to. It goes on to say, he now lives, praise the Lord. We've worshipped him for that this morning. We've rejoiced in it. But what is it that's special about his life? Is it that he is grateful now that he can uh, take in certain things? Um, you know, well, I won't give examples, but is, is it that he is grateful just to be alive generally? It says the life he lives, he lives to God. That is the focus of his life. It was the focus before, of course. Because Jesus, when he came down to this earth, he said, I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. And he had a perfect communion 
with God the Father. So it was always his life to live to God. But you remember that on the cross there was that brief time when the Father turned his face from the Son. When the darkness fell and Jesus, as I think I said on Friday, said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For a very short time, Jesus knew the separation that we knew through our sins. Well, actually more than that, in a way we can't understand. But Jesus, for, for a time, he had that fellowship with God, the Father, broken. But now, now the fellowship is there in its fullness. And they're together, of course. You couldn't get a closer communion than that, could you? We could picture the Lord Jesus rising on that day, on that first day. Well, obviously we could think about the moment he died and, and in those time between the two, between his dying and his physically raising. But let's just think about his being raised on this earth. And he comes back to life. And I think the first thought on his mind, we don't know, but I imagine that the first thought on his mind was something about God. Yes, he was going to appear to Mary Magdalene, as we've considered this morning, and to many of us. But essentially, he was alive to God. And although your version, every version I checked, it says that he lives to God, there is also a sense in which it can say he lives for God. Isn't that Jesus' aim, to bring glory to the Father? He lives for the Father, first and foremost. His desire is to bring him glory. It tells us in the future, when the Lord Jesus has subjected everything, or rather God has subjected everything under Jesus, and he's reigning there with nothing to challenge him, it tells us that then he himself will be subjected to the Father. There is always, throughout time, well, throughout eternity, the recognition that the Lord Jesus lives for the Father, for his glory. That's what he seeks. And for you and I, the same. Romans 14 and verse 7 says, For not one of us lives for himself. Well, we do sometimes, don't we, in, it, in how we choose to live our lives. But the, the reality for us as believers is not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Saying the whole focus for us as believers is to be for the Lord. That's what he's raised us to new life for. It's not just so we can walk around this earth happy to be alive although that's all important but it's so that we can have a heavenly perspective a heavenly mindset eyes for heaven the life that he lives he lives to God and that was reflected of course in what happened after he was raised yes for a time in his mercy he made resurrection appearances to different people but when those 40 days were over, he went to where his life was based, in heaven. He lives to God there. He lives for God there. And prays his name as part of that. He prays for us. And so Paul, having said, this is what the Lord Jesus did and does... He now links us together with the Lord because your life as a believer, if you are a believer this morning, is completely bound up with Christ's. What Christ did first was the pattern for us and is our example, is our inspiration, is the truth that we are to live by. <clears throat> and so Paul says in verse 11, even so, <coughs> excuse me. Even so, just as Jesus did that, so you. And when we're tempted to doubt and question things, we need to remind ourselves that Scripture tells us plainly 
that just as certain things are true for Christ, so they're true for us. <coughs> even if we don't feel it, even if we've not come to experience it in its fullness, your life and Christ's are linked. Paul says, even so, consider yourselves, have a mindset that accepts that you are dead to sin. Just as there is that death that Jesus died once for all, so we are in the good of that to live as those who are dead to sin. Now in the verses we read at the beginning, it gives us a picture, a picture of baptism. And it tells us, and, and Paul is speaking to the Romans who have been baptised, and he's basically saying, you, do you realise what that meant when you were baptised? It doesn't just meant that you got wet. And it wasn't just a profession of faith, although that's important. It wasn't just you making a public sign and declaration that you were now a Christian. It was also I, you identifying with Jesus' death as you went into the water. And then you identifying with his resurrection as you were brought up. And praise the Lord, you don't have to stay down for three days under there. Yours happens a bit quicker than his did. But you are buried in the baptism as you go into the water and then raised when you come out. And it's identifying with Christ. You didn't physically hang on a cross and then be physically put into that tomb. But as we go into the water and come out, we're identifying ourselves with what he did. And so therefore... Just as he died to sin, we are to consider ourselves to be dead to sin. We can effectively say when we're tempted to sin, I've identified with the Lord. I have been buried through baptism. And I'm now dead to those things. Isn't that a wonderful thing to say when we're tempted? To remind ourselves, no, I don't just have to struggle against this in my physical strength, with my will, and just try really hard not to sin. Actually, I can tell the devil when he comes, uh, and his angels, and they come to tempt us, and I can declare to myself, to my flesh, I can declare to the world if I need to, if people are coming to try and tempt me to sin, I can stand on the word, and I can say, I died to sin. I'm considering myself to be dead to sin. And therefore also to be alive to God in Christ Jesus. So just as the Lord Jesus was raised to life and able to be alive to God, to have that completely restored, full fellowship with God and to be seated in those heavenly places in the same way, even though you and I aren't physically in heaven right now, we are to reckon ourselves to consider ourselves as alive to God. What I have shared and what we think about sometimes about being dead to sin is very important. And it is something that I find helpful and you might find helpful from time to time when sorely tempted. But sometimes we can stop there, can't we? And we can say, yes, I've died to sin my whole life, yes, I need to lay those things aside. The things I did before, they're no longer to be part of our lives. But we can stop there and not think about what the Lord has died to bring us into. That it's not just about laying things aside. It's not just the list of don't do this, don't do that, don't do this anymore. It's a new life. It's a new self, it says in Colossians, that we're to be clothed in. It's not just taking one thing off and having nothing on. It's taking off our old self that we died to, to put on a new self. To put on Christ, his resurrection life, by his resurrection power. And sometimes we might not even think of the first part of dying. But sometimes if we do, we forget there's a glorious second part. And I think that's where the Lord would have the emphasis, particularly this morning. 
we've worshipped the Lord Jesus and said, praise you, Lord, you're raised. And it's like the Lord Jesus would say back to us, but you know you're raised as well. Do you know that you too are sharing and can share in what I have achieved? The Lord would say, I'm sure, back to us this morning. If we are alive to God, it means not just that we are just alive generally, but that we have a purpose to be alive. We have a purpose to live. Our purpose is to know God and his son and to bring him glory. If we just were to think for a moment about an example in this room, let's say one of you was dead physically. Let's just indulge me for a moment. Uh, let's say Peter. Uh, sorry, Peter. Um, you don't have to act the part. <laughs> yeah, oh, do you feel it? There we go. Well, maybe I've chosen the right person. Um, but let's say Peter for a moment was dead in this room. I couldn't have a relationship with him. He could be in the room and I could be in the room. I could even sit next to him and I could see him and I could know about him. I could have all this knowledge about who Peter was and what he did, uh, all of these other things. But I couldn't have a relationship with him because as far as I'm concerned, he's dead. And there the illustration ends. <laughs> but for you and I, if we are dead... And it may be that in this room you might be dead this morning to God. If you are dead in your sins, as it tells us elsewhere in the Bible, if you are living a life where you are just focused on yourself and your selfish, selfish ways, you are dead to God. In other words, you can't have a living relationship with God. Because what it needs is for you to die to your sin. To make that choice that says, I am going to leave that past behind and I'm going to trust in Jesus. And in that moment, as you do that, God will raise you up and give you a new life. So that then it's no longer that you are in a place where you can't relate to God. Then you are in new life, just as it when our illustration ends and Peter's alive again. Now I can have a relationship with him. Now I can talk to him because he is alive. He has the same kind of life that I do. Just as I'm alive and my heart is beating, Peter's life, is he is alive. His heart is beating. And we can share something because we're two human beings who are both alive. We can talk together and discuss experiences and experience things together. We could talk later on about how we both found the service this morning. He might have a different perspective to me. But we can share that together because we have the same life. Well, if you have given your life to the Lord, it is possible, it is true, that you have the same kind of spiritual life as Jesus, as God the Father. So now you can relate to him. You can talk to him. You can share things together. He can open your eyes to things that you were previously dead to, cold to. You can say whatever you want to somebody who's dead. They're not going to understand or respond. But if you're alive, all of this can be yours. Are you alive to God today? What are the vital signs? You know, there's things we can do to test if a person is alive or not, can't we? We can check their pulse, for example. There are vital signs. What are those vital signs of being a believer? It means that there's, amongst other things that we could pick out, a two-way conversation. A two-way relationship. If you have the same life as Jesus, then you can interact together. And it's not just saying your prayers and, and, and just hoping that they've got somewhere. It's not just knowing God as somebody distant who we can talk about God up there somewhere. It's having a certainty that is given to us by the Spirit who's given by God. 
a certainty that we are alive because we have a living relationship where we talk to God and he talks to us. Where we read the Bible and as we read it and pray, we feel God speaking to us. And we feel him helping us to speak back to him. We feel his help to pray and to praise him. And of course, as well, we feel his guiding hand. Okay, maybe not all the time in every moment of life. Maybe sometimes we're waiting a bit for certain things. But where we can say, yes, I know he's alive because he's done this for me. Because he's shown me this. Ultimately, because he's forgiven me. And I know that guilt has gone. I know I'm forgiven. And yes, the devil sometimes comes and tries to make us guilty again. But we can come and say, I have given my life to the Lord. I have repented. I've surrendered my whole life to him. And I am forgiven. Vital signs. Are you alive to God? Scripture does tell us to test ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And you need to be sure. We can't go into the next life just hoping that we are right with God. Scripture offers us the certainty. The certainty so you can know you have spiritual life. And there's not much that I can say here from the front, but praise the Lord, it's not just limited to talks. You know, if you're not sure, if you're not sure that you're a Christian, if you're not sure you have those vital signs, talk to one of us. Talk to somebody who you know is a Christian. And ask for that help and that advice and that prayer so that you can really be sure. But if you are a Christian this morning, in the sense of if you are truly alive to God, then live in the good of that. I say it to myself as well. Because our feelings sometimes tell us something different. If our circumstances are bad, or if we're particularly being targeted by the enemy, we can sometimes feel like there's something not right. And sometimes that's a reminder for us to pray and just check that we are right with the Lord. But sometimes our emotions can make us feel like we're not alive. We can feel weighed down. We can feel choked. We can feel a bit dead. And yet we need to hold on sometimes to scripture that tells us you are alive if you're one of God's children. We can't trust our feelings. After all, you might not be able to feel right now that you're alive in every way. Okay, I trust that you know if you're listening to me that you're alive. But you probably can't always feel your heart beating. You certainly can't feel the cells at work within you doing various things. But that doesn't mean that's not happening. Just because you can't feel your heart beating and those cells at work, it doesn't mean you're not physically alive. And so too spiritually. We mustn't listen to our feelings. The truth of God's word says, if you've given your life to Christ, you are alive. And that should encourage us to say, never mind what I'm feeling. I might be going through this. I might be feeling that, but I am alive to God. And I'm going to live in the good of that. And I'm not going to let the enemy tell me of all. there's one way I could sum up what I feel is the message that I want to get across to myself and to all of us this morning. It's to say, live as those who are alive. Live as those who have spiritual life. Because if we have, if these truths of scripture really are true, then we have a relationship with God, with all that that brings. If it's really true that we are seated up there in the heavenly places, then everything that is up there can be ours. Every right spiritual perspective, every bit of grace that we need, we're told to come before the throne of grace. It's all there for us to enter into. If we'll stand firm on what the word says rather than what our feelings say, then we can receive all grace and we can have all communion and we can have the guidance that we need and the wisdom and everything that we need.
that flows from a relationship with God. So I want to encourage you tomorrow morning when you wake up, whatever time you wake up, whatever day you might be waking up to, whatever the trials, whatever our feelings might be, that you wake up tomorrow and I wake up tomorrow and say, I am alive to God. Not only do I rejoice that I'm alive physically, I can, I can hear the birds singing and I can see uh, the light outside and I can walk around and feel the life with me. I'm alive spiritually. I'm alive to God. If that can't be true of you, if you don't think you can wake up tomorrow morning and feel that, well then, today, take the opportunity to enter into that life. If you have that life, wake up tomorrow and say, I'm alive to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. As soon as it has to be a considering, never mind what your mind says and your emotions say, consider yourself not just to be dead to sin. That's very important. But also consider yourself to be alive to God. And then you can enter your quiet time and say, whatever's happening, here I am, Lord. I'm, I'm coming to your word. I'm considering myself to be alive to you because of what Christ did in uh, dying and rise, rising again. So, Lord, speak to me, please, because I'm alive. I'm going to return to that illustration just for a moment with Peter. If Peter is alive now, then I can have the certainty that when I walk up to him, well, pretty much the certainty that I talk to him, he's going to talk back to me. Because we have that same life. So you tomorrow in your quiet time, you can come. And because you have that spiritual life, the same life as the Lord, you can know, if you're right with him, that as you speak to him, he'll talk back. And he'll share his life with you. He'll share his heart with you. Is there anything better? There isn't. Whatever we might think, there's nothing better than to be alive to God and know that fellowship with him. Well, let's, in closing, just read the words in Colossians. There are various scriptures that put the same truths in just a different way. And in Colossians 3 and verse 1, well, we have in some verses before that, for example, Colossians 2 and verse 20, it says, If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourselves to decrees? And it's talking about the legalism there. We touched on this on Friday as well. It's saying, if you've died to those kind of things, why are you living as if you're still alive to them? But then it goes on to present the positive in Colossians 3 and verse 1. Therefore, if, it presents as an if, of course it's a certainty if you're a Christian, but it says, therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, if this is really true, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Christ really truly was raised and he really truly is there and so this is true for you and I as well set your mind on the things above not on the things that are on earth for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God when Christ who is our life is revealed then you also will be revealed with him in glory and as we close we mustn't forget of course that although what we've been saying and thinking about is true spiritually and we have to live it by faith, yet there's going to be a physical reality to this too, isn't there? Because it says one day Christ who is our life now, he's going to be revealed and will be revealed with him. 
And then there'll no longer be need to be that same faith that says, I don't really feel alive spiritually, but I know I am. Oh, we'll feel it. In that day, we'll feel it all right. We'll be stood there with Christ and we'll see him. There'll be nothing between us. No more hint of sin whatsoever. And just as it'll be reality, then that we the, the deadness to sin has been completely fulfilled and there's no more sin, so it'll be completely physically reality that we are alive forevermore in those resurrection bodies always to know perfect fellowship with him hallelujah might not have explained it very well but I hope that you can take at least that phrase live as those who are alive and if they're not yet seek that life today let's pray Hallelujah, Lord. We rejoice in your victory. We rejoice in your victory for yourself over sin and death. Lord, we rejoice that you were vindicated and you will be fully vindicated one day when all your enemies bow before you. We thank you, Lord, that death didn't hold you. How could it, Lord, when you were so perfect, when you were the king of the universe? But we thank you, too, for how you have made it so that we can identify with you. We thank you you did it all for us. Not just to put on some show, but for something to be really true in our lives. Oh Lord, help us, we pray. So that this wouldn't just be an if, but it would be a certainty. Settled in our hearts and minds. Help us, Lord, to take in and stand on the truths of your scripture. And lead us on to enter into more and more of your resurrection life. To know more and more of your resurrection power. Lord, you deserve nothing less. When you've done all this and you've made this possible. Lord, help us. Thank you, Lord, for your compassion and your understanding. Thank you for your intercession for us. When we don't live the resurrection life fully. But we're, we're here this morning to say, Lord, we want to. And we want to grasp these truths. Thank you every year we have a reminder of them. Help us to do with this reminder what you want at this time at Easter. And to reflect it to others we pray. As we worship you and rejoice in you. Thank you Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.